Hello, O2-2 group. This is Colonel Gallagher coming from the courtesy of his house. And today, let's talk about this. This is a little cartoon I sent you. And this is about the word hysteria or panic or fear. We've seen this already, haven't we, in our day today? <laughs> yes, this is a roll of toilet paper. And yes, it's probably like the last one. Um, so if someone's hysterical and panic, could be me. Um, what we want to talk about today is something called McCarthyism. Uh, the idea of the Red Scare, the second Red Scare. And this occurred during the Cold War. Uh, and I'm going to use a couple things to show you. Uh, as I showed you the hysteria here, okay? This is the light of liberty, the torch, right? Lady Liberty in the harbor there, Statue of Liberty. And then this is the gentleman with the bucket of water going up the ladder. And this fear, this panic, uh, during the United States, in the United States during the Cold War, uh, specifically grew dramatically during 1950 and 54. And this was a courtesy of a man named Joseph McCarthy. He was a senator out of Wisconsin. And Joseph McCarthy uh, went around trying to get people to believe that he would personally protect them. Now, the reason McCarthyism matters, and I'm going to keep this rather brief, is because there's a tremendous lesson. Um, the first thing I want to start out with, though, before I get into the 1950s, is something we have to remember. In 1776, one of the greatest events in world history occurred. Um, in fact, there's two. And the first one is the one you're probably thinking of. And this is the creation of the American government, the independence movement. And so when the United States was born, it was born on the premise of certain constitutional and, and personal rights. And so these are known as our liberties. These are our freedoms. Uh, that is the first thing we have to look at. The second thing that happened in 1776 uh, was a book was written called The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith. And this is the proposed creation of the idea of a free enterprise system. Now, why start there? Because that's where the United States started. And the best thing, whenever you think of the 1950s and this communist revolution that was supposedly going on everywhere, and what I meant by that is that the Americans, McCarthy said there's communists all over the place and all these communists exist in your government. He created this sense of hysteria and this sense of panic. And on that fear, in this sense, he rode his way to popularity. People lined up behind him, but not a large majority. And why I started in 1776 is there was a gentleman who had a great quote and a great line. And he basically said this, freedom of speech is a pillar to the freedom of government. In other words, a free society can only operate appropriately if free speech is allowed. And this gentleman went on to say that if this free speech is not allowed, then it erodes the constitutional purposes of the state and in what is put in place is tyranny. This would be probably the best line I've ever heard to apply to McCarthy and to McCarthyism. Um, this gentleman who had this quote was none other than Benjamin Franklin. And Franklin should know, and the reality is what the Americans tried to do the best they could is to wrench themselves away from tyranny. McCarthy happily put it in place. The greatest irony of this all is the very agency we were most afraid of, the Communist Soviet Union. I'm going to show you the playing card that we saw them no different than what the Nazis have established in their tyranny. And so the Americans then, ironically, became more conformist less about individuality. The liberties that we had based ourselves on were eroded because if you didn't agree with McCarthy, guess what happened? You ended up on his list and he would call you out. And this became a problem. And he helped ruin several people's lives because of this. He went after specifically one man uh, named uh, Drew Pearson, now, not the receiver for the Cowboys. This was an older man. And Drew Pearson was a journalist, and he claimed Drew Pearson was this, this communist sympathizer, and he was going to help lead this communist revolution, and this became absolutely ridiculous. Drew Pearson was a very thoughtful, reflective journalist, although Drew Pearson was a muckraker. He dig, did dig up dirt, okay, on others, including McCarthy. Uh, so Pearson's really problem, he was a journalist. Um, and he happened to uh, kind of do what journalists do, investigate. Okay, there's no sense that he was this massive communist person. Okay, um, so this fear and paranoia uh, led to the idea of McCarthy's rise, but it led to two things. People either lined up with him or people were absolutely afraid of him. This was this fear. 
I mean, after all, you should know this, whatever happened before freedoms, right? With FDR, you know, the freedom of speech, freedom of conscience, okay, the freedom of thought, okay, the freedom from want and the freedom from fear. This seemed to go by the wayside. And so what we get in when we look at Joseph McCarthy and McCarthyism is the idea that maybe there's a better way to oppose this. Um, what led to McCarthy's downfall, um, and who really didn't like McCarthy, and this is one of my favorites, is white David Eisenhower, the president himself in 1952. Eisenhower cannot stand him. Uh, Eisenhower saw him as, as, as for what he was, okay? And one of the number one things that McCarthy used was character assassination. He went after people and after their personality and drug in all kinds of different uh, accusations where some of them were totally unfounded. But people had a fear of this man, and he used it. He used it as a weapon until one day, 1954, McCarthy decided to go after this incredible institution in the United States known as the United States Army. And he did this on TV. And when he did it on TV, it all fell apart. People recognized him more for what he was. But taking on the Army was just a stupid move um, because you had a series of generals and others that realized this guy had to be stopped. Dwight David Eisenhower was probably the happiest man that in 1954, the downfall of McCarthy, who, by the way, was an absolute drunk uh, and a lot of times was raging alcoholic <laughs> and uncontrolled. Uh, in fact, that Drew Pearson guy I told you about, McCarthy ended up uh, beating up on him uh, in, a, in, a, in a nightclub in front of none other than Richard Nixon, who was there dining one night. And Richard Nixon, in fact, is the one who got in the way and stopped the fight because Richard Nixon's famous line was, let a Quaker, you know, stop this fight. <laughs> it's a good line. And Nixon, for goodness sake, was in charge of this thing or one of the main members of this thing called HUAC, H-U-A-C, House Un-American Activities Committee. The Cold War got so bad that we created a committee, an entire committee, in order to find out what was un-American. And let me tell you what they found out was un-American. Let me show you the other cartoon. Well, you've got, you've got this one. That's the Girl Scouts. The Girl Scouts ended up as this rabid communist organization. Are you kidding me? Included the one problem is, what kind of books were you reading? So when you think about this, this is an insane reaction and an overreaction. Now, should we have a fear? Um, we should have a concern. And what was probably put best in how to end this is the better way to oppose communism when you look at it is not give up your liberties. And in a sense, have a truth where people get to speak openly and discuss. And because of this, you can find out. Think about it. But to have the freedom to express one's own viewpoint, McCarthyism has a tremendous lesson. We shouldn't want to end up like these guys. <laughs> by the way, excellent book, Hell and Back by Ian Kershaw. Get it. It's good. Okay. Um, the last thing I want to leave off with is the other man I mentioned briefly, and that's Adam Smith. And Adam Smith, in 1776, wrote The Wealth of Nations, and his line was just as appropriate here, where he said, every man, as long as he does not violate the laws of justice, should be free to pursue their interests. It's about competition. And how in the world can you have competition with Joseph McCarthy? We've seen this before in history. And it's a terrible, it's a scary, scary moment where these folks rise up and promise security, but only at the expense of your liberty. And I'll go back to Franklin, who I started with. Anyone who gives up any of their essential liberties, and I think you know the rest of it, deserve neither liberty nor security. This is a great tale. And in our common era today, it's no different. Democracy is based on the masses and the population. And it's a wonderful gift. It was a gift to Athens, too, which was squandered. And those are the lessons of history, including there. <laughs> so beware, okay? McCarthy's or not, think for yourself, okay? And you guys have a good day. Think of the Cold War, the irony that the Americans, in order to protect their liberties, became conformists, <laughs> which was the opposite. And I know, being an NMMI... <laughs> Isn't it fun? It's a contradiction, isn't it, sometimes? Because we're a military school, but, you know, hey. Okay, so it's a kind of interesting dynamic. Yet it's a good school, okay? And you guys know it. And we try to bring our best to you. I hope from you the best to us, which you always do. Thank you.
All right, I'll see you guys in class. Think on this for Monday's assignment. Bye-bye.